morning, everybody. It's Margaret Hirsch. You're at home with Hirsch's, and we are live streaming now on Facebook. And we're saying hello to everybody, and especially to people who've joined us online now on Zoom. And all those hundreds and thousands who are joining us are live on Facebook and those who will listen to it after the after this recording goes live. But anyway, so we're talking today about men's health, which, you know, I run lots of women's clubs. I'm always about women and women's health and how you're feeling and you know, being vulnerable and Brene Brown and all those type of things. And then we had so many men joining us who were saying, what about us? We still are here and we, we've got to take these things on. And it's a different world, you know, the old patriarchal society where the man was the head of the house and he was King Kong and everybody bowed and scraped to him which was fine until the shit hit the fan and he had to now juggle these all these other responsibilities including having to be the man of the house and be strong and be out there for everybody and a lot of men didn't know how to handle it and they they started to crumble and they they didn't want their wives to see them crumbling because their wives were used to them being a strong guy out there making everything happen so we're just dealing with men and how it's going to work. So I'm going to hand over, to, I'm going to first of all, thank Jess and Stacey for being here from Connectable Life and ask Jess to, to come in and introduce our guest speaker today, who's Damien Fairley. We're going to talk about men's health today. Okay, I'm going to jump in there. I would like to introduce, <laughs> um, introduce Damien. Damien, thank you so much for being here today. We are so excited um, to hear all that you have to say. It's really wonderful that we are doing a men's session. So thank you for joining us. Um, Damien is a holistic health coach and yoga teacher and has been involved in the health and wellness industry for the past few years. His experience includes teaching yoga and fitness classes, teaching mindfulness and yoga at an addiction rehab center, and running local and international yoga and um, yoga adventure retreats with his wife. Damien also has experience in nutrition, meal plans, cooking for events, and meal prepping for clients. More recently, he graduated from IIN to become an um, integrative nutrition health coach. Damien finds the most joy in helping people. His, he is gifted by connecting with people in a way that makes them feel safe and comfortable. So thank you so much, Damien, for joining us. Everyone, welcome. And we are so excited to uh, have this morning together and just chat about all the things, men's health and what surrounds it. <laughs> Perfect. Thank, thank you, Stacey, for that lovely uh, introduction. It was fantastic. Thank you. <laughs> um, okay, so I'd like to get started by, uh, as, as Stacey said, and as Margaret touched base on, we're going to be talking about men's health today. So I'm going to take it a bit of a different route to the way some of you might have uh, pictured this conversation going. So most people think about health in terms of nutrition, and exercise. That's that's generally the first two that come to mind. Maybe lately mental health become part of the picture as well. But traditionally, what you eat and the amount you exercise is what is going to determine whether you live a healthy lifestyle. And I'm here to tell you that that is not the case. You need to look at it uh, in, a, in a kind of broader picture, right? So the first kind of point that I'll bring to the table is that uh, those two things, nutrition, exercise, aren't the be-all, end-all. You can eat all the broccoli in the world, but if you are not looking after yourself mentally and maybe you're not considering your home environment and your relationships, the things that bring you joy in your life, your stress from work or, or from finances, if you're not looking at some of those other things in your life that might be affecting you, um, you can still lead an unhealthy or be uh, unhealthy because all of those things impact you, whether, whether you realize it or not. Um, so a good thing to kind of do uh, if you wanted to do this little exercise is create a little pie chart. And on that pie chart, you maybe split it into 12 categories. Uh, so you divide the, the pie chart into 12 pieces. And in that pie chart, put... 12 things that you might consider important in your life. So obviously nutrition and exercise should be in there because they are important. But then also, like I mentioned, finances, your home environment, joy, uh, et cetera, et cetera. And then on that pie chart, you can maybe uh, think of the center of the pie chart being zero and to the outer perimeter of the pie chart being 100%. 
go around the, the categories there, put a dot on each line, and then do a dot to dot kind of round the pie chart. And you can see where you might be lacking in some of those certain areas. So that's a little exercise that you can do in your own time to kind of just see maybe some things that you wanna work on throughout the year. So with it being the start of the year, it might be a good time to do that. And then you can kind of set yourself some goals to work on throughout the year to try and broaden your, your uh, circle of life, if I could give that pie chart a name. Um, yeah, so I'm interested to hear what everyone else's thoughts are on that. Yeah, thank you, Damien. And I think from my side, you know, the old patriarchal society where the man was the head of the house and he took care of everything, the finance, the, anything that was worrisome, he took care of. And my relationships with my husband has never been like that because I, I came from a, a family where my mother was the head of the house because I never had a father. And so I just ordinarily I took over and I became the head of, of my house. And it was so much easier for my husband because he didn't have all these things of the finances and everything on. Finance, I think, is really, really important because that can make you feel so drained but let's talk yeah. about men and and you know men you know the old thing cowboys don't cry and men today are vulnerable they're much more attuned with their emotions and that or are they the men that you come across are they attuned with their emotions or do you find that they still hold back don't you know it's not me i'm 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 okay i'm okay jack you know um how do you yeah. find that are today yeah so that that was going to be the next point that i was going to touch base on and that is that men tend to kind of wear a suit of armor around their hearts, right? And their emotions and their feelings. Um, I don't know where it comes from, probably from childhood, maybe their, their dads were like that and they taught that we don't, or they, they, they've, they've learned that they don't speak about emotions and, and how they're feeling. And so they kind of hold on to all of that stuff. And that stuff can really start to weigh you down if you're not talking about your feelings and your emotions. And if you are struggling with finances, because that is very stressful, especially in today's time. Um, and if, if you're the male and maybe you are expected to be the main breadwinner or whatever it may be, even if that's not the case for your household. So yes, uh, Margaret, in, 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 from my clients, I have seen that males in particular, they, they, don't, they don't show that vulnerability and that that openness to talk about emotions and feelings and, and what's kind of uh, weighing them down. Um, and that is something that needs to become, uh, come to the forefront of, of men's health in particular. So that's why that is, that, that's why it was one of the main kind of points that I wanted to start with um, is that we need to break down that suit of armor, right? And just express how we are feeling and, and, and talk more, whether it be with a loved one, a friend, family, et cetera, et cetera. Um, if you had to open up and, and just try it with someone, you might be surprised at how good you actually feel afterwards. Yeah, I think a lot of men are not used to doing that. You know, if you've been the macho guy all the time with your husband, you know, with your wife, and suddenly you start to say, listen, I'm having these vulnerability feelings, your wife's going to say, what the hell happened to you? You know, Stacey, I don't know, how's your relationship and how do you work around that type of thing? Yeah, this has been so interesting for me to hear because as you've been talking, um, uh, I found that I actually put quite a lot of pressure on my husband to be mm -hmm. like the everything. So I need to also start uh, just being more open in my own space and just saying I need to take on a bit more myself, you know, so not always put all the pressure and like especially all the financial pressure I mean that's something that I often just load onto him and quite happily because I don't really want to deal with it so um you know that's it's something I need to work on but as you were talking also it reminded me of my my I've got four boys so this this conversation is very important for me um mm -hmm. for men's health and um I was thinking about my third born he is he's he throws the wildest, craziest tantrums and cries over everything. And it's really exhausting. And I mean, just this morning, I, I, we had this giant meltdown and I just, I said to him, just go to your room and just cry there. Like, I can't deal with this right now, you know? And it's something as well that I need to allow him the space to have those meltdowns and know that he can cry and know that he can be vulnerable and open, but we need to work through it in a different way instead of just like, stop crying, you know, I can't deal with this. Um, 
you know, and just say to them, okay, go to your room, have a cry. I'm coming there. We'll talk about it and just be a little bit more sensitive to his emotions, you know, also because they're wild boys, I get angry with his sensitive emotions sometimes because it is exhausting, but I need to not close that space off, you know? Well, yeah. I always say the mothers are the ones who make the men like they are, you know, say, yeah. oh, you, you know, you like this. Well, your mother made you <laughs> like that. So, I mean, I must say, I've got the most divine son ever, I think, I have to tell you. But anyway, that's another story. Jess, how do you feel about that with your relationship yeah. with your husband? Do you put pressure on him or do you share it half and half? Um, I like to think I don't put pressure on him. Uh, <laughs> I, I do. We are quite equal in our duties. He's, he's equally as involved in the kids and um, I think we, we've always been a two salary household. Um, so I like to think that I don't, but going back to the point um, in terms of where does this all sort of start that men don't necessarily mm -hmm. like to talk about their feelings. I definitely think it, it starts in childhood. And I think it yeah. unfortunately starts with parents. You know, your, your child hurts themselves. And in that moment, you want them to feel better. So the first thing you say is, you're okay, you're okay, don't cry, you're okay. And you kind of like stop the healing process. And the child's like, but I'm not okay, I'm crying, I've just hurt myself. And they sort of condition to always think that they're okay. And they're conditioned to start thinking that there's a way other than crying or a way, you know, we, we start telling them not to feel sore, not to feel sick, not to feel upset. Um, and, uh, you know, if this happens year in, year out, eventually, when they do feel sick, they're going to be like, I'm not sick, I'm okay. Um, and, and, you know, compress those feelings. So I think as parents, we can also start to op open these conversations. And if a child hurts themselves and starts crying, not to say, you're a big boy, boys don't cry, stop crying, you're okay. To rather say, you know, something like, I see you've hurt yourself. I'm really sorry you've hurt yourself. Let's sort it out. Let, you know, and they, it, like, I know when I do that with my boys, they sort of, stop in their tracks and they're like oh it is okay we can put a plaster on and move on but it's you know when sometimes when they hurt themselves and they almost don't get the attention that they're looking for that it maybe becomes bigger than it than it needs to be because at the end of the day they're kids and they need attention and they need love and they need help um and it's it's up to us to give that to them so that they aren't conditioned to think otherwise now, um, Damien, when, when guys come to you and you can see that they're holding it all in, holding it all in, how do you let them come out? Because a lot of guys don't have men friends that they can talk. You know, they're the bat slapping, beer swilling guys. You can't go and say, listen, I'm feeling so vulnerable. You know, I, we, we haven't paid our bond this month. My wife wants a new car. And I've got, I've got all these, these things, these issues that I've got to deal with. And, and I just don't know which way to turn. Do guys come and open up to you like that? Or do you just say to them, I don't know, what do you do when they come to you and you can see that they're actually holding something back? Yeah, that's a great question. Um, and I think you can, if you start to talk to someone one-on-one, -on -one, you'll tend to pick up whether they are kind of holding back or not being completely open and, and vulnerable. Um, and that might not happen in the first session. It might take one, two, maybe three sessions to really start to break down that wall and, and get deeper into to emotions, et cetera. But a good, a good place to start is maybe just to kind of open them up to uh, looking at the more holistic picture is by doing that circle of life that I mentioned at the very beginning of the conversation, just so they can maybe start to think about things uh, more holistically. Um, so like where they might be lacking or what, what might be um, going on under the surface. And then from there, you can start to speak about uh, emotions and how things, because then as the coach, or you can see like, okay, this person's home environment, they rated quite low. So what's going on at home? Um, or like their finances were quite low. So what, what, what about finances is affecting them? Um, and, and then you can start to dig deeper by just asking, uh, like open-ended questions to start to see, um, did the finances start at childhood? Was the pan the family perhaps uh, not not best off, and and that's when they started to learn about having this closed off mindset to finances that they're never going to have enough, and they they perhaps themselves aren't enough. Um, so yeah, I think that's kind of the approach that I take with most clients is starting with the circle of life, and then just gently starting to dig deeper and deeper and see where the conversation goes. 
Yeah. And so when guys come to you and they, and you sort of pick up that there is a problem and often it's relationships because they don't know how to express themselves. They've, they've got, they've married this woman. They've now fallen out of love with her. They've, they've got these kids to hang on to. And they've got all these things that issues that, and often it does manifest itself in something in their body, which now they start feeling sick or they start getting stomach ache or they start, yeah. this is happening or that's happening. And it's just how it's manifesting. When they come to you, do you start off with nutrition and exercise first and then go into the other or do you start off what is the problem and then let's fix yeah. the exercise how do you start uh, another great question so uh always always circle of life i always kind of that's one of the main things i start with because as the coach it gives me a broader perspective of what's going on but i do like to start with nutrition uh, uh, as well um mm -hmm. it is one of the kind of foundations that i'll always start with i myself am vegan and have been for the last couple of years I've raised, one. Yeah, <laughs> yes. I've raised my daughter vegan since birth throughout my wife's pregnancy we were bo uh, both vegan my wife was vegan um and she is thriving she's three years old now and uh just absolutely incredible so um anyway i digress um <laughs> always start with nutrition always start with nutrition i believe that when you start to clean up your diet your your nutrition it's easier to start to feel better so one you might have more energy and your mind becomes clearer because you're not weighed down by uh, all of these additives that are in processed food and excess sugars and too much salt and unhealthy like fat meat hanging fat. down and big yes, lumps it's, it's, it's the heavy it's weight so that you have to so carry with you without even realizing it because you've done it for so long you've lived that way for so long you don't even realize that you are actually feeling that way until you start to clean up your diet once you've done that, you'll within two weeks, I have no doubt that you will start to feel more energized. Your mind will be clearer. You can actually start to think clearer. Okay, this is what is actually affecting me uh, emotionally. Then you can start to speak about things. So yeah, 100% diet is one of the foundations that I always start with. And what about meditation? Because I mean, I find meditation life changing. And, and my yeah. friend, Da Smith in, in Peter Marisburg teaches meditation. And she says it's been life changing for her and for her family as well. I think, don't you think meditation, and, and you speak to a normal man, you know, the beer swilling, back slapping chap about med meditation, he's going to say, oh, no, that's all you who do and who do and blah, blah, But once they start, if you can just get them through a guided meditation and let them start thinking about it and, and just thinking. The other thing I want you to talk about is the difference between mindfulness and mind power because you teach mindfulness and i teach mind power um mm -hmm. talk to me a bit about the difference between those two okay so i'll i'll go back to meditation to start off because that's what you kind of brought to the table first mm -hmm. so yes that was going to be one of the next points that i kind of actually spoke about was meditation so thank you for bringing it uh, bringing it forward and meditation is very powerful uh, i myself meditate daily if possible um it doesn't need to be anything extreme um if you have the time to go to 20 minutes 30 minutes great most people don't um five minutes five minutes is enough just to when when in your busy day do you take five minutes just to kind of switch off not be on your phone not worry about what meeting you're rushing to what friend you need to see what shopping you need to do putting petrol in the car, fetching the kids, et cetera, et cetera. There's always a to-do list. If you can stop doing that for five minutes, switch off everything, sit down, quieten your mind, your thoughts, just breathe. When do you focus on your breathing and just actually slowing down? Um, so uh, Stacey in the beginning mentioned that I teach at an addiction rehab center. There's often big groups there, uh, 20, 30, 40 people. Um, of which uh, a good proportion are, are male um, and teach meditation there weekly. And uh, sometimes my wife comes with me. She's a sound therapist and a sound healer. So they, they get to experience that as well. And they, 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 don't, they can't express the gratitude and the breakthroughs that they have through those moments of of peace and silence and just kind of slowing down and checking in. Um, so, so meditation is extremely powerful. Um, and, and I use that as the example of the, the addiction rehab center, because it is such a big group that I can actually tell you that they, they often tell us at the end of a session, that was amazing. Thank you. They, they've never relaxed that deeply or they haven't let go and they have all kinds of breakthroughs emotionally, um, and mentally so 
very important. Um, and I would just recommend starting small. Start small, even two minutes for a week. And then the next week, add on another minute. The next week, add on another minute until maybe you get to a comfortable kind of place where you are meditating um, enough for your day and the time that you can allow. Um, that would be the kind of starting point that I would recommend. Do you think that should start with a guided meditation or to just... I think, to yeah, just I think that's a very, very good point. Guided meditation, 100%. If, you, if you're not used to it, download an app like Insight Timer. It's one that I use all the time. It's fantastic, free, um, loads of, of options to choose from. Um, and guided because then you it takes the the confusion out of it or the thinking or not knowing where to start. Do I focus on my breathing? Do I focus on the time? You just put on a guided meditation, you sit in a comfortable place and you just listen. That's a great introduction. So if you don't have the kind of, you don't know how to start, like I mentioned, starting with two or five minutes, start with guided for a couple of weeks. And then when you, you're starting to get more comfortable with the practice, then start like that, five minutes of just kind of sitting by yourself. Because in guided meditations, you'll learn all kinds of techniques to actually try and play around with by yourself and, and, ex and experiment with. And see what works for you, because not everything it, works for everybody. There's now, so many different... Mindfulness Sorry. and mind power now. Tell me sure. what, what your interpretation is of mindfulness. So, so mindfulness, I, you just kind of... Uh, you're, you're trying to be more aware of your interactions with people around you and your environment. So you are trying to consciously stay aware of uh, your interaction with a work colleague or, or your thoughts that pop up throughout the day um, of how you handle a situation or your interactions with your loved one or your kids, etc. So you just you purposefully trying to carry this mindful approach to your your daily routine and your lifestyle um, and your interactions with everyone. Mind power, I I say, is um, being. Well, how can I say this? So, just being strong mentally, right? So, knowing that if you are if you have a slip up in your mindfulness, that you can get back on track quicker you're not going to let that uh your, a bad interaction or the way you handle the situation affect you throughout the rest of the day so that that's kind of the one aspect of mind power is that you can you can adjust you can get back on track um by applying a little bit of mind power right that's kind of the one aspect i see of it but maybe you can elaborate a bit more seeing as you do teach mind power over mindfulness yeah, well, I teach mind power where you decide what you want and you just go for it. I mean, you're just so, so conscious. And I'll just give you something that happened to me yesterday. Well, New Year's Day, I wake up and my computer, which I live and die for, is completely dead, completely dead, completely dead. I'm in Zanzibar. There's no Apple store here. So I go and find the local Apple store. He says, I'm sorry, that this is completely gone. It's never going to work again. You just have to write it off. Now, I've got another computer in Joburg. How am I going to get a chair? So I sit down and I look at my computer and I just focus on it for about an hour and it came on that is my interpretation of, of mind power uh, the day before they had phone to tell me my mother was having a heart attack and she was dying and i said just leave her there i will sort her out i sat i focused on her for an hour my mother's up and she's running and she's I took a walk yesterday she had her food they say so i'm a great believer in mind power i teach mind power i was taught by robin banks who is just amazing and and i believe in that you, you can take control of your mind but you have to be strong to do that you, if you yeah. if you position you really really can't so i see hash is coming he says father i've raised my voice to understand that your emotions are part of you god has instilled emotions to help you express yourselves i'm a single father that's raised three sons and a daughter well hash congratulations to you because i could only manage two children i really couldn't manage more than that myself mm -hmm. but anyway but i think it's important that as parents we we teach our children that it's okay to let it all out to be vulnerable stacy you've got four boys tell us about it's busy, gosh, I tell you, mm -hmm. there isn't a day that goes by where I don't want to pull my hair out. Um, but yeah, we, uh, you know, uh, something that was uh, mentioned earlier, like made me 
think about the fact that, you know, men do struggle to talk. And like, as I was thinking about it, I thought to myself, you know, very often they won't go to a close friend. They won't go to a friend or family member and they'll just keep it inside. And that's where there is such power with seeing a specialist, seeing somebody like you, Damien, a health coach or whatever, where they can find an external person, book a consultation with them, and they can really just be vulnerable in that space and open and honest and lay it all out. Because, yeah, I mean, I know with my husband, he's not going to want to go and share always with his friends. You know, you feel like you're burdening people. That's how, I mean, that's how I feel very often with with, um, my issues. Like people are tired of hearing about it. So that's where I love seeing a specialist because I, I can just say everything I want to say, you know, and I don't have to worry about their emotions and how they perceiving it and how they see me and how much more so for men often. Mm. Yeah. I know I like to say to, to kids, like you have hands, you have legs, you have a head, you have a heart, you have feelings. It's, it's, you know, like was said in the comment, it is something that you are built with. There's no getting away from it. So um, it's it's either to to face them or to bury them, and they only come out harder later on. Um, but d- is Glenda's finger? Oh, sorry. Um, sorry, just. <laughs> I, I, I just wanted to quickly come in, Damien, and yes. um, discuss um, yoga because I'm also sure. a yoga teacher. But I, I'm so excited that you are. And do you teach men? And how? how beneficial do you find it for them because so many men seem to hold back from doing yoga because it's like you know yoga you know do i need to stretch but i mean it you know how beneficial have you found it and i want you to tell the men on this um on this uh zoom and the women the wives to persuade their husbands to do more yoga because wow it does work so well for men yeah no 100 percent. so I'll start off by saying that most people don't actually know this, but yoga was created by males. Women weren't allowed to do yoga when it was when it originated. It was it was banned to them. So to all of the males out there that think that uh, yoga is specifically for females, that's not the case. Um, yes, they are now carrying the torch brightly forward for yoga, and that's amazing because women tend to be more in touch with their emotions and their thoughts and and uh, their feelings. And, and that's great because that is a really deep part of, of yoga. But uh, you don't need to be scared of that if you are a man. From anything from this conversation, it's going to help you do that, to start to explore and to express your emotions and feelings. Because like Margaret just briefly kind of mentioned and when she was talking earlier, we, we carry emotions and, and, and feelings and thoughts and baggage within our bodies. So through yoga, you can actually start to open up these blockages that you have um, and you'll have profound breakthroughs of, of mental patterns that you might be carrying of thinking or emotions you might be carrying somewhere that you didn't even realize you were. And again, I'll use the example of the addiction rehab center I teach at. So I go there and I teach mindfulness meditation but also yoga. They do yoga for an hour with myself and they can't express how amazing it is. Um, and I use that again as the, as the kind of example, because it's such a big group to kind of pull information from, right. And get their feedback. Um, so and there's a huge male kind of group there generally. So um, some of them have actually gone on two of them, which isn't a huge proportion but two of them have actually gone on to become yoga teachers afterward that's how much they fell in love with yoga so don't be scared of it if you if you are a male some of my private clients that i teach yoga to are are males and um whether you're doing it for the emotional the spiritual side of it or just for the physical kind of benefits of which there are numerous as well um that's often the kind of main draw card for males is to become more more flexible more supple stronger and it'll start there. And then throughout that, that practice. As you then, said, yeah, yeah, exactly. 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 It's very important. So if that's where you start, great. But with enough practice, they'll start to realize, yeah. wow, there's actually more to this than just the physical side of it. So that's, that's how I started. And I'm speaking from experience. I was uh, teaching fitness, exercise. I played uh, semi-professional soccer. I coached soccer. Uh, but I was neglecting stretching and and 
the, the flexibility side of it. So I started doing yoga with enough practice. I was like, wow, there's actually more to this. After about a year, I started to dive deeper into it, went on to do my 200 hours, my 300 hours. Um, and I've just never looked back since. So yeah, does that, does that kind of cover it for you, Glenda? Does that, cool. Awesome. Yeah, that's amazing. And I think it's so, so important. But, you know, people are embarrassed because, I mean, I know from myself when I, I, I would never have gone to a yoga class. I started with Glenda because she was teaching me one on one on Zoom. It was in lockdown. We couldn't get to each other. <clears throat> and I found that it was easier for me because if I couldn't quite do it, she couldn't quite see it. And she wouldn't say to me, oh, you know, everybody else is holding this pose for 10 minutes and look at you. You can't hold it for three. So she wouldn't actually know that I wasn't holding the pose for that long. And she was also more, um, she was more better with me that I, if I was in a class, I would have felt embarrassed because I was so inflexible when I started. And now we've been doing it for two years and my husband who would never join us, I was going to say, don't you want to join us so tomorrow? Glenn, I'm very happy to tell you that he says from tomorrow he's going to start joining us. So I'm very excited about that. <laughs> But, you know, so just going to show, it took two years of me doing it, you know, every every week for him to now decide maybe I should do it as well because he's seen that I'm more flexible than him. And, and as people get older, and for the older people on here, you tend to, you know, you bend down, you can't put your shoes on, you've got to tie your shoelaces, it's a fag, so you start wearing slip-on shoes and things like that. Those things should not happen because when you look at old people, how do you know they're old? Because they're inflexible. And if you can just keep that flexibility going. But uh, Damien, when people come, I mean, obviously if you come to you, you can do one-on-one -on -one. I would still never go to a class I would feel too embarrassed because I can't stand on one leg for long longer than three seconds I'm going to interject there quickly Margaret um you shouldn't be embarrassed so that's the one of the kind of things that we're kind of talking about here is that everyone needs to start somewhere right go to a class experience that group kind of energy and and atmosphere and have some fun with it don't worry about if you can't balance on one leg for longer than two seconds it's it's part of the experience and the journey right i mean it shouldn't matter in my yeah. opinion yeah yeah and, and tell us now so you you deal with men's health but also women's health do you find that women are more open and will talk about it and men sort of hold back a bit yeah yeah 100 percent. no no definitely women are, are way more open to to this kind of thing than than males and that's i'm trying to push it in the other direction because but I do think we could take a page out of a woman's book, right? So, so women are great at their self-care um, and, and speaking about emotions and thoughts. So maybe the next point I can just briefly bring to the table here is that let's take a page out of, out of women's uh, self-care book and let's, let's try and as males start journaling perhaps and go for maybe more massages and take a long bath um, and, and relax and, Let's start doing more self-care so that you can actually start to soften up and, and get in touch more with your feminine side because we all have male energy and, and feminine energy, every single person. And oftentimes, males are way up there with their masculine energy and their feminine energy, energy is kind of tucked away in like the little basement section in a box, uh, in another box, in, a, <laughs> in the deepest <laughs> corner. So let's, let's start to break through all of that by taking a page out of a woman's self-care book um, or the ladies and, and start doing more of those things that can actually get you more in touch with your feminine side. Um, yeah. Now, yeah. Now, the other part that I wanted to touch on and, and go into you dealing with addictive person, you know, you, you start off having one glass of wine and then you have two glasses of wine and then you have three glasses of wine and then it's Christmas time and you're having, you know, a bottle of wine that lunch and a bottle of wine at, at supper and suddenly you realize oh my god it's January and now I'm craving this wine I want my wine at lunchtime I want my wine at supper time I by the way don't drink at all anymore I cut out drink completely but um I've seen it with a lot of my friends where they start drinking a little bit and then suddenly they're drinking a lot and they don't realize it and to them it, it's just like you know having a smoke it's, it's it's a drink it's a drink it's a drink and suddenly they they I realize that they're addicted, but they don't think they're addicted. How do you deal with that type of situation? Sure. Um, well, firstly, I'd like to just kind of bring to say again there that um, everyone is addicted to something. I feel it. I feel. I feel like it's quite bad that people that drink a lot or are addicted to drugs are the ones that are labeled as addicts. Mm. Generally, any person can be addicted to something, whether it be 
coffee, if that is what you're drinking now, yeah. uh, <laughs> c- cigarettes. People uh, say I'm addicted to work. I work all the time, but I love Exactly. Work. Everyone is addicted to something. More, more than likely, everyone is addicted to something. They just don't label it with that addiction kind of tag. So um, I think we need to break that kind of stereotype for one. Um, and it, it's a tough one. So maybe with the, when it comes to the, the drinking side of it is start to crowd out those that addiction, so alcohol. So when I say crowd out, I mean, instead of having a drink, have something else. So you're trying to replace that alcohol with something that you still enjoy. So maybe it's uh, um, some soda water with some lime. I know it sounds like a, a kind of an easy way out, but crowding out is quite a strong technique to use with anything. So I'll use smoking, for example. If you're thinking about having a cigarette, go uh, for a walk or go speak with, uh, phone a friend um, or or go have a piece of fruit. Like try and crowd it out with a healthy behavior um, instead of um, doing the, the, the opposite. So going to have a cigarette or have a drink. Yeah. Damien, I just want to jump in there while we're talking about mm. the healthy behaviors and mm. coping mechanisms. Obviously, we yeah. all need a way to cope. And sure. mindfulness, journaling, yoga, these are all, you know, healthy coping strategies. And then you get your yeah. unhealthy ones like drowning your problems and the alcohol or the drugs yes. or whatever it may be. Because these sort of stereotypically speaking, drinking is more masculine than feminine. Do you think a lot of men sort of slip through the cracks when they're drinking too much because it's seen as more normal than a woman drinking too much, for example, because I know statistically speaking, more women attempt suicide, but more men are successful um, that in terms of actually dying by suicide. Um, and I saw a survey the other day, something like 45% of the men admitted to having mental health problems, and 43% of the men said they wouldn't reach out for help because of it. So um, there's obviously this huge stigma surrounding it. There's a stereotype surrounding it. So generally speaking, a lot more men turn to, to alcohol and drugs to try and cope with whatever it is that they don't want to talk about. Um, what would you say to that? Do you think that that is something that's going on? Yeah, no, I would 100% agree with that, um, Jess. I think that's it, because guys, like that's what the whole conversation today is about, is that guys don't talk about their emotions and their feelings. So they turn to the easiest thing and that's to drink right it's it's it blocks having to do that so it, it lowers your inhibitions it it triggers things in the happy hormones in the brain to kind of make you feel all bubbly and happy right and um so you can forget about the things that are weighing you down right and that's just the way like you said it's a coping mechanism but an unhealthy coping mechanism of dealing with that and actually facing your problems head on by working with someone like myself or a therapist or a counselor or, or checking yourself into an addiction rehab center if it is if it is bad enough to do that or warrant that um yeah that is definitely a very valid point that you that you have and that is what, the case. what would you possibly say to to those men you know like man to man kind of message <laughs> oh, that's that's a good one uh, <laughs> I would get them to try and just get in touch with what actually is the problem. Um, they would need to speak to someone. And that that is, I think, the best possible solution. Instead of trying to, them dealing it with them with it by themselves has got them to that point where they're just drinking, they don't know what to do. So that's clearly not working. Uh, don't keep doing what's not working, right? Um, what, what's that saying from Albert Einstein? The first sign of insanity is doing the same thing over and over again. I'm kind of paraphrasing a bit, but you get my point. So what they're doing is clearly not working. So try something different. Talking to someone is one of the best things I would recommend. So uh, if a friend or a family, you feel like they're not going to be open to it um, or it's going to fall on deaf ears, then speak with someone who's, used to helping people that, that i mean that would be the best possible solution and if they themselves don't have the experience or, or maybe the case is too severe most professionals would be able to then refer you to someone who is in the right place to help you 
Absolutely. Stacey, how do you feel about that? And you, you're speaking to people and, and you've got friends who you see that are really drinking too much. I see uh, Shane says, just juice January. So we sell juices at Hershey's and in January we're juicing all the time. Our Nutribullis is our biggest seller in January because everybody now has decided that they're going to detox, they're going to live this healthy yeah. lifestyle. This is what they're going to do. And of course it doesn't last. How yeah. do we get it to last? So David, that's my question to you. So Stacey, you talk first, then you hand over to David. And David, how do we make these things Things lost, you know. Cool. When I get my husband to do yoga, will he get up and do it with me at five o'clock every single morning? I don't know. I'm going to try it. Uh, but a lot of these people start. Oh God, it's January. I'm going to do this. I'm going to do this. And phew, you know, the, the saying is by the 18th of January, all your New Year's resolutions are out the window. So, Stacey, you come in first. Then, yeah. Daniel. I, I believe the number one step is accountability. So, I believe that no matter what changes you want to make, um, the best is to find an accountability partner. So whether it is a coach, a, um, a therapist of some sort, a friendship group, your yoga group, uh, whatever it is, find somebody that you can journey with and be accountable with and have the conversation constantly about. And if you fall off the wagon for them to be able to say, it's okay, come, let's get back on it, you know? That for me is I'm an accountability person. I need somebody saying to me, come, 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 let's go. <laughs> Okay, Damien, from your side. Um, do you mind just repeating what you wanted me to cover, Margaret? And, yeah, and to, to the men out there who think that they might have this addiction, they don't, they don't know what to do, where to go, where do they start? Where do they start? Um, so that's, that's kind of what, what Jess was saying. So... Um, yeah, I would start by trying to find someone that's within that kind of world to, to help you, right? So whatever it might be, whether you are wanting to focus on your nutrition, then, then try and find someone who's versed in nutrition kind of coaching or a nutritionist or whatever it may be to, to help you through that. Whether you know that you have a drinking problem or you suspect maybe your friends have mentioned that to you, then, then speak with someone um, who can, who can uh, help you in that area. But you also asked, sorry, that's what that's what it was. You, you had mentioned uh, kind of New Year's resolutions and, and sticking to New Year's resolutions. We kind of, for the first month, we start off going gung-ho. And I think that's that's what people tend to do. They, they're like, it's the new year. I'm going to get fit. I'm going to eat clean. I'm going to meditate daily. Um, their list is way too long of what they are wanting to do. Start small. Start with an attainable kind of goal. Um, whether that be cleaning up your diet, like I mentioned, that's my foundation to kind of start with. And then from there, progressing that. So do that for January. One month, you're going to start to clean up your diet. Then the next month, introduce a kind of daily meditation. If you overwhelm yourself with way too many things to do from the self, you're going to, from the start, you're going to burn yourself out and you're going to, you're going to fall off the wagon before you even know it. So start with something that's you feel is really important to you, stick with that one thing until it becomes a habit and then start to uh, add on to that progressively from there. Remember, you, you're trying to undo years of ways uh, of, of old habits and, and the lifestyle. It's not going to happen overnight. It's going to take a bit of time to actually do that. And that's where people, I don't think, realize that. We live in a world now of instant gratification. People want things like that. They want things to happen overnight. And that's, that's never going to happen when it comes to health um, and, and wellness. It, it's going to take time. Um, so, yeah, that, that's kind of what I would say. Start small and progress uh, in little increments from there. So when um, it starts that's... with your diet, what, what do you actually say? Oh, sorry, Glenda, come on in. Uh, Margaret, sorry, I just wanted to say, just talking about that, so interesting. I was listening to a podcast this morning by BJ Fogg on the doctor's pharmacy, Mark mm. Hyman. I listen to him yes. just about every day. He's fantastic. He's fantastic, and yeah. He was, he was talking about make um, behavior changes stick, but you can only do it if you take small, you, you, you make it small. So every, every day you take a habit and it's and it, it's just something tiny. So you get into the habit of maybe not putting salt on your food um, mm -hmm. and just stick to that for a few days and just Interesting make that morning. a habit and let it and let go from there. But if you start small, um, eventually things will work out. So yeah, that's what his advice was. It was so You good. also feel like you've achieved because now yeah. you've done it. 
And then it urges you and motivates you to do something more, more, more until it becomes big. A hundred percent. I think we also need to remember that everyone is a bio individual, right? So one approach, like what Glenda just brought to the table, that might work for some, a, a certain proportion of people, but certain people might be slightly further along. So they are ready to kind of do something a little bit bigger than, than just that, the, the changing of uh, removal of salt, for example. So we just need to kind of keep that in mind as well as that, uh, that approach, which is good. And I agree with it. That's kind of what I was saying, little increments, but uh, it just depends on, on case to case with each person as well, right? When people come to you and they're starting now, I'm going to start off. This is it. I'm going to change my lifestyle. When you, with food, what do you start with? You can't tell them to become a vegan overnight because they're used to eating copious amounts of Kentucky fried chicken and, and great big roasted lambs. So, you know, you've got to start. And what about starting to say, what about juicing and just having juice with everything, you know, juicing your celery and your apples and things like that? And yeah. how do you start with it? Yeah. Yeah. I think juicing might even be a step too far for a lot of people. So, um, I, I, I would push to go vegan, but that's not going to happen overnight. Like it's not going to happen instantly, like I was saying. So I would start off uh, with like a meatless Monday, for example. So they're just going to drop the chicken. They're going to drop the, the steak. They're going to drop the fish for that Monday. They're going to eat. They're gonna essentially going to eat a vegan diet for, for the most part. They could still have their dairy and their, their eggs, maybe if they wanted that. So just meatless. So taking the meat protein out of it, right? And then from there, maybe on another day, they'll try and drop the dairy. So a different day, they'll drop dairy for the whole day. Um, and then maybe on another day, so within one week, the one day they're dropping meat, another day they're dropping dairy. And then maybe on the weekend, they like to cook or they like to bribe, whatever it is. They are going to pick some of their favorite kind of recipes and they're going to try and veganize it. So they're going to make it vegan, pull in a loved one, have a bit of fun, experiment with it and see how that goes. Eat foods that you enjoy. So like finding a favorite recipe, try and veganize that. There's lots of uh, options out there to kind of substitute some good, some bad, <laughs> but that'll take some experimenting to kind of figure out. And they can go to my vegan cookbook if they need to start. But then they start to exercise because exercise, you know, everyone goes, oh God, I'm going to run. I'm going to run like miles. And you don't, you can't run yeah. miles because you're so unfit. So what do you start yeah. with, say some yoga and just say a, a little bit, I mean, I'm a swimmer, uh, Glenda's a swimmer, so we, we swim. But for sure. those people who are sitting there with like big couch potatoes now and they're just blown up over the COVID and over Christmas, where do they actually start with exercise? Well, if they're comfortable with going to a yoga class or doing a kind of remote Zoom uh, yoga class with someone who's qualified to do that, then that's that's a good place to start. Any kind of movement is better than none. Um, but walking, I would recommend walking to to everyone and anyone. It's low impact. Everyone, well, not everyone, obviously there's certain cases, but most people can walk, um, and that's that that's a fantastic place to start. Again, for the first week, you're going to walk 6,000 steps. Second week, uh, 7,000. Following week, 8,000. Until you can kind of average 10,000 steps a day. And that might sound like a lot. But if you park a little bit further away from the shopping center, if you take the stairs instead of the escalator, if you, I mean, there's many different ways you can try and reach those 10,000 steps in a day easily, in my opinion. Um, so that, that would be the main kind of point that I would give for people that are maybe carrying a bit more weight that, that aren't um, maybe a bit further along in their fitness journey is just walk, start to clean up your nutrition and start walking. Start walking and, and doing actually, yoga, yoga helps, sorry, sorry Stacey. That's actually such a nice idea is to, um, you know, use the stairs rather, park your car further away from the shopping center or the shop, you know, so that you have to start exercising more just in those small little increments yeah. and making those small changes. Exactly. Everyone wants to find the rock star parking at the shopping center for what? <laughs> I mean, just, just park a little bit further away. You're going to have to walk Long an extra times. minute. I mean, it's <laughs> not going to make that much of a difference. <laughs> <laughs> And yeah. one of my friends who started and was over uh, 300 kilos and has brought himself right down to 68 kilos, which seems impossible, wow. but he has wow. done it. 
And he started, he couldn't even walk to his front door. Then he, he got to the front door, then he could, couldn't walk to his gate and he walked to his gate. And so he just went on also in small increments until now he's running marathons. So it oh, just it so it is, it definitely, can, definitely can help. So we've gone through all the, the relationship, the spiritual part of it. I just want to go to the spiritual part. I mean, we've got people here that are Jewish, Muslim, Christian, the whole lot. How important is that spiritual part that you've got to know that God is walking this journey with you, that if you've got no one else to call on, you can call on him. And I see here one of our ladies um, put up earlier in the chat, I'm just gone past it now, um, where she said that, she, uh, oh, Naz said, she said, I'm a mother of twin girls and it's a hard road, but I always put God first and yoga is a good start, it helped her a lot, but she had to put God first. And I think that's so important that people don't realize that as well, that whatever, even if you're non-religion, you can just, you know, and know that God is walking this journey with you. But oh. um, yeah, it's, it's just incredible. I think we've gone through such a lot today with all the different things. I think we, the one thing we didn't touch on is relationships. I think it's so important to have a really good person in your life. I always say to people, the person who's building you up, you keep them around. As soon as that person starts putting you down, you get the hell out of there. You know, you don't hang about. Um, Damien, I mean, you, you've got a wife, you're happily married and everything. But when you get guys who are really not in a happy place, or women even that come to you and say, I'm really not in a happy place. What do you say to them? How long do you persevere? And when do you say, this is me, I'm out. Yeah. in a relationship is that what you're asking uh, so i mean i'm never gonna uh, i'm never gonna tell someone listen you need to pack your bags and leave they need to come to that decision by themselves uh you you, you can't tell people to do that but you can ask them the right questions to start to is that person uh like you said lifting them up is that person helping them um progress and evolve as a person or are they kind of keeping you stuck at a certain level because that's what as people we we need to evolve and we need to grow and if the if your partner if your person uh, is not doing that with you and is not on that journey with you then you need to start to maybe question is this person right for me and it, it's a tough question for a lot of people to ask because they they are so used to maybe being with this person that it's scary. It's a scary thing to think of to if you need to get divorced and if there's kids involved, there's so many different factors uh, involved. So um, yeah, it, it, it's, it'll take a lot of time. Uh, I mean, it'll take a lot of the right thinking and questions to kind of get to that point. Um, but uh, yeah, I would advise someone just to kind of sit with it, meditate with it and, and ask themselves those questions like I just briefly mentioned. Yeah, and I think the one thing you said, you've got to grow with your partner. You have to be growing on the same path. You can't be growing in different directions because yeah. that doesn't work. So I, you've got to spend more time talking to each other to make sure that you're constantly on the same path and you've got the right goals and no better time like now when you're doing your goals for next year, you've done your vision board for next year, are you on the same path? It's very, very important. So Jess, just a wrap up from your side um, on, on talking about men's health. And I think it's, we've come to the conclusion that men definitely need to be more vulnerable. They need to be aware of their emotions. They need to be able to express their emotions. I think that's the one thing that's come out of this. They can express their emotions and not get embarrassed about it. That would be, they are 90% there. How do you feel, Jess? Yeah, I think my message would just be to, to normalize that, to normalize that feelings don't necessarily have a gender. They don't have a demographic we are all made up of emotions, made up of feelings and just allow everybody the space to feel them because I think it, it does. It starts with us as a society and as parents of the next generation to, to change that narrative because um, of the whole cowboys don't cry scenario. And um, so obviously people aren't going to feel like they, and men in particular, aren't going to feel like they can be vulnerable and open um, about their feelings if we're not allowing them that space. So for us as, as women, as society, as parents to just start changing that narrative, I know something I've noticed with um, a pattern at Connect for Life is that we probably maybe slightly more women reach out for help than men, but in terms of the actual conversion, far more women actually book the consult than men. Yes. So men are out there looking for the help, but they're not actually committing. Because I think when you, when you hit that book button, it's like, oh, okay, now I've actually said I need help. And that's the scary part. It's, you know, we, we may be fully aware of the fact that we need to reach out for help, that we're not okay, but society has told us to be okay. So it's really difficult to, to actually take that step and, and hit that button. So, mm -hmm. and with, with men in particular. So just to, 
to start changing that narrative and to tell all the men out there that it is okay to not be okay and it doesn't make you any less of a man or any yeah. um, any less strong or whatever it, whatever it is that you're telling yourself or people around you are telling you um, to just take the leap of faith it will certainly be worth it yeah I, I would yeah. like to say that it's going to make you more manly by actually mm -hmm. by saying that you need help and that you 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 are struggling with X Y Z um instead of it being the opposite way around and that it's more manly not to ask for help because it's not yeah absolutely yeah and stacy you'll wrap up from you well i have loved today it has spoken to me about the things i need to be saying to my boys and my husband and um encouraging them and making these small little steps and changes and just me being open to allowing them to have their moments you know allowing them to have their space and not being so hard on them sometimes you know um so thank you so much Damien it's been eye opening for me I definitely need to start meditating more you know I also I love Mark Hammond and he's he talks all the time about how his day is crazy busy but yet he always finds the time to meditate because it is one of the best stress relievers so thank you for um shedding light on that that's been pretty powerful for me pleasure it's a pleasure. Yeah, meditations. I mean, if you look at some of the top achievers in the world, if you have to look at some of their interviews, I'm, I'm probably about 90% sure most of them would mention meditation at some point um, and how powerful it is. So if it's working for, for those people, there must be uh, something behind it. And it's been around for thousands of years, right? So there's definitely something there. And Margaret, your man... Um, what do you call it? Mind, mind, power. Power. mind power. Mind power. Like, and I mean that's exactly it. Mind power. So sure, that is incredible. I definitely need to start doing more of that in my day. <laughs> yeah. It it reminds me of um, sorry, Margaret, but it reminds me of a set book when I was teaching uh, English at high school. Um it was set in the Australian outback called The Walkabout. But it's basically this the stage of a teenage boy's life where they have to go out into the Australian outback and survive on their own. And um, if they see what they call a Libra, a female, they can have the, the look of death in their eyes. And to try and cut a long story short, um, two a, a little white, uh, not Aboriginal, Mary and Peter, they little kids and their plane crashes, and now they are stuck in the in the Australian outback and they come across this little Aboriginal boy and Mary, the little girl, he starts doing his ritualistic dances and she gets a fright. So she's got a look of fright on her face and he mistakes it as this look of death. And he ends up dying in oh this, in this book because of this, of this power of the mind that um, oh, he's wow. now seen the look of oh, death is... and so now it's time to die. Yeah. And it wasn't yeah. that of course, but, um, and they actually did a whole lot of experiments on it. It's very interesting. But um, the, yeah, it was a novel that that we used to teach. But yeah, absolutely, the power of the mind is incredible. Yeah, one hundred percent. Incredible. You can make yourself do anything. So, Damien, a wrap up from you to all the men out there, and to the women who are looking after the men out there who know that they need help and have to get them to help. What's your wrap up to them? Sure. So, uh, from the woman's side of it, I wouldn't be too too pushy. If you if you're going to do that with a male, they often quite stubborn and they're not going to want to do anything if you do that but a good place to kind of start is maybe just having a conversation just talking about it uh religiously so just as often as you can and the space allows you're going to start to talk about these kinds of things and then if the if the if they agree that the male needs maybe a bit of outside help then let it go that route but don't be too pushy and too forceful because men will not uh be open to that so just be gentle in your approach um, and, and guys will tend to start to open up with enough time. Um, and then from, from for the males out there, uh, there's nothing wrong with asking for help. Reach out, talk to someone. That's kind of been the whole uh, theme throughout this as well, um, whether it be with someone close, family, friend, loved one, um, or if you're ready to take that next step and, and speak with a professional, then, then, then do that and kind of see where it goes. Um, yeah. yeah. Fantastic. Um, now, Stacey, who have we got for next week? 
Next week, we've got Lee. She um, was with us a couple of weeks ago, and she is going to be discussing burnouts. So very exciting. Oh, wow. okay. So if somebody feels they yeah. have burnout, I don't know what to do to escalate it. <laughs> Thank you. Yeah, let's start, our, let's start our year off knowing that we don't need to burn out. So that's mm -hmm. very, very encouraging. Yeah. I think Lee has walked a, a, a journey of burnout, burnout herself. So a lot yes. to, to be gained there. Okay. Thank you so much, Damien. Thank you so much for being our guest speaker today. Thank you to Stacey and Jess. Thank you to Glenda for putting Pleasure. it all together. Thank you thank so you much. Thank you, James, for coming in. Thanks, Damien. Thanks, to host us today. And thank you all so much, as we've thoroughly enjoyed today, Damien. You've been amazing. You. I saw there are a lot of guys out there who are going to be watching quietly when nobody's listening but to them. <laughs> sure. <Yeah. And laughs> And your details are on there. Shane's going to put it below. So if anybody wants to contact you, they can. Thank you so much for being our guest speaker today. I really appreciate it. Love Perfect. what you do. Love the yoga bit of it. And hope everybody starts the new year on the right foot. Thank you, guys. Okay. I'll see you next week. Thank, thank, you. thank you so thank much, you, Margaret. Thank you, David. Bye. Thank you. Okay. Bye. Bye. Bye.